The fish and chips were the best I'd ever had. Out of curiosity, who cooked what? Brother Charles replied, well, I'm the fish fryer. <laughs> okay, she turned to the other brother and says, then you must be. She, he said, yes, I'm afraid I'm the chipmunk. <laughs> All right, that's the new book. I'm going to throw that one away. <laughs> All right, get your Bibles out there. Stand for the reading of the word, Galatians chapter 2. Paul, most of the time, matter of fact, you see Paul, although John, who was one of the sons of thunder, and who was very boisterous and mouthy, at the end, God had changed him, and he was known as the apostle of love. The same way with Paul, Paul was known for being so fierce, when he was Saul, he was so fierce that he wound up causing a lot of deaths, a lot of homes been broken up, he caused a lot of pain, and so when God changed him, God did a tremendous work in Paul's life. And so Paul, although he was not called the apostle of love, Paul still, he was an apologist. Okay? Uh, uh, John the Baptist, he was not. Paul was, I mean, Paul was an apologist, means he takes the word of God, breaks it down, and convinces you with a mental argument. And so Paul, most of the time, has got it going on, but when it comes to the book of Galatians, this is called Paul's only angry letter. Hear that? It is Paul's only angry letter. And the reason that he's angry is because the, <clears throat> the church in Galatia, actually because they're, they were losing all kinds of problems, they were losing things, they were losing their homes, they were losing their land, their family was actually tearing up their birth certificates and was not being associated with these people. So because that, people were trying to please God and trying to please man at the same time. They were trying to please the spirit and they were trying to please the flesh. None of us have ever done that, have we? Have you ever tried to please the spirit and the flesh at the same time? Am I the only one? I'm going to preach this over here then. Okay. And here, <laughs> I think I tell y'all, don't get off the quiet. They even got started yet. Amen. And so because of that, Paul writes this letter. And now they're trying to do temple sacrifices, and at the same time, this pleasing the flesh, they're trying to do temple sacrifices, and at the same time, they're trying to accept the blood of Jesus Christ. They're trying to keep everybody happy. I promise you, if you serve God, it's impossible to keep everybody happy. Amen? Amen? And so Paul was angry because they were making Christ's blood of none effect because they were trying to bring their works in along with the work of Christ. A lot of us are the same way. We try to bring our works in or we try to please the flesh and try to please God at the same time. And that is a battle that you will lose every time. And so the answer to this, Paul gives it right here. Turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse 18. This is the first of probably two or three more sermons. So I say, well, thank you for telling me that. I'll be sick next week. <laughs> Just play it. Although Doug is sick this week, he didn't know that. Doug is sick, and I wrote and said, I got a bug, and I don't want to spread the bug. And I, I wrote back, thank you. We don't want to spread the bug. Nobody, who wants the bug? Not me. Okay. Ready? Y'all say this with me. Y'all read verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18. Read it aloud with me. Ready? For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Let's do it one more time. If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, and, and I might live unto God. Ready? Here it goes. I said it. Verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me <coughs> and gave his life for me. Let's stretch forth your hands the way it is. That's God for a special touch. And Lord and Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that you're alive and well on the throne, Father. We know, God, that you're working in our midst. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch us, Lord, work through us and to us this day. Help us to see. Show us, God. Help us to move forth that we can get stronger in you every day. We know, God, that you're in control, and we trust you 100%. We give it all to you in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Church said it. Look at somebody and tell them, the past is behind us. The future is with us. I mean, the future is ahead of us. God is with us, and nothing shall be impossible. Amen. Give the Lord a hand back to praise. Now, <laughs> Paul, look, Paul said, I'm crucified.
crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Get that image in your head. Crucified with Christ. Wow, what an image. Every time I look at that, that just does something to me. It makes me think about God. Am I pleasing me? Am I pleasing you? What, what am I doing, God? How am I working on this? That is, now you living in me <coughs> instead of me living in me. So let's go on. Let's move on a little bit here. The strategy of Satan. Listen carefully. Please, if you're taking notes, please take them. This is so important. The strategy of Satan is, watch this out. He desires to affect your thinking your life and your relationships in order to infect your thinking, your life, and your relationships. Think about it. He wants to upgrade your thinking, and if he gets you thinking the wrong way, he can infect your thinking. If he can get to you in your life, and he can affect your life, then he can infect your life, and then things that you once adored you no longer adored, the things you used to hate, now you love, back and forth, things that you know you should be doing, you're not doing because your life has been infected by Satan's strategy. Moreover, relationships. He wants to affect your relationships so that he can infect your relationships. And when he does that, here it goes. What happens? Relationships become something hard instead of something good. It becomes something, instead of something vital in your breath to have, now it becomes something that you wish you could even get out of. So watch this. It's very important that we watch this understand the strategy of Satan. Now, now I don't know if you know it or not. I, I, I saw this and I thought about it. Here's Moses up on the mountain. He's got the Ten Commandments. He says, These are fine. But what's in it for me? <laughs> One more time. Moses got the Ten Commandments and he's talking to God. These are fine. <coughs> What is in it for me? You know, I, I can't even hardly believe it. We, we live in a, a what's in it for me society. You know, I was, I even told some people, I think it was Tuesday night, I'm not sure. I was in Walmart the other day, and <clears throat> I was telling the guys in prison. Uh, I was in Walmart the other day, and a guy actually had a paper cut on his finger. Working behind the counter, got a paper cut. And you would have thought somebody had cut his fingers off. He was crying so hard about that finger. And there was an older lady behind him who had been working there for 20 years. And she was saying, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> and he was going, but you don't understand how bad it hurts. Somebody needs to take care of this. And I couldn't even see it. And I just watched that movie on Audie Murphy to hell and back. You know, Audie Murphy, how many heard of Audie Murphy? The most decorated soldier in World War II. At the age of 16, he tried to enlist in the Navy. And he said he was too little and too uneducated, or too, too uh, uneducated and too little. He tried to get the paratroopers and said, you're too little. So finally, the army that he did, and they tried to discourage him in a combat unit, which is, I want to be in a combat unit. So at the age of 16, he's in a combat unit fighting in World War II. By the time he's 19, he's been shot and injured so bad that he's being released from the military. <clears throat> But by this time, he has, run, has, risen, has rose up in the ranks, or risen, how do you say it, rose up in the ranks uh, from Buck Private to uh, First Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant, and was an acting captain. He had three, y'all can help me if you know, three, five, six Purple Hearts. He had the Congressional Medal of Honor. <clears throat> Every other kind of mock, uh, Medal of Bravery in the United States had to give at him, throw at him. The French gave him their Medal of Honor and the things of that because he protected so many men and took so many men and helped them and saved their lives. Other countries gave him all these medals. And I thought about that thing as I was sitting there, just watched the movie. It was still in my mind. I just watched it a few hours before and I'm here while I see the guy going, I gotta go home because I got a paper cut. <laughs> I, I was just Boggled. And, and, and so the lady behind him, she said, how are you doing, Mr. Lentz? I'm doing okay. I, I said, uh, and, I, and, and I said, you know, uh, uh, and I, we talk, me and her talked about Audie Murphy, and that guy was going, who's Audie Murphy? Somebody help me. I got a paper cut. And I said, you know, a, a modern-day uh, Audie Murphy. 
Should have got every kind of congressional medal of honor for personal suffering, and that was Bethany. I said, if you could see her insides, the way it was eating up with cancer, and the way that it was coming out of her body. And I changed her bandages every day, twice a day, and I never, not one time in a year, heard that girl complain. I'm not just saying that. I'm telling you, she never complained, not one time. Whenever she'd get ready to complain, she'd say, God's got this, Dad. Or she'd say, either the way I win, Dad, all the time. And now, of course, today is the anniversary of her death. And so, so again, here it is. Look at this. What's in it for me? Society, You know, it hinders, this attitude hinders the move of God in our life. Not only does it hinder the move of God in our life, it hinders the work of God that God has called us to do because what's in it for me? You know, Jesus warns against this attitude. He tells us how to get beyond it. In Philippians 2 and 5, he says, let this mind, this attitude, this purpose, this humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Now, now think about that. So here's Jesus. He created everything, and now he's going to he's going to come to earth in the form of a, of a baby. And he's going to be vulnerable to his own creation. To the point where they actually kill him. Can you imagine? And God said, let that attitude be in us. Forget the paper cut. What kind of attitude do we have? You see, let's, let's, just, let's take this a little further here. This, we're, we're radical service. Amen? At Calvary, it was about us. Y'all say at Calvary, it was about us. Say it. But now that Jesus is risen, it is about his kingdom. Y'all say it's about his kingdom now. His kingdom. Amen? Romans 12, 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living Sacrifice. Look at that word. Living. Living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, God's not asking you to do something unreasonable. Who in here wants to climb up on an altar, uh, sacrifice on an altar, actually, to put up on an altar and bled to death? Who in the world over here wants to lay up on an altar and bleed? Honestly, if I have my choice of things to do, that's not one of them. That poor guy with the paper cut could have never done it. Hop in an order and believe. God says, we are, we are, I beseech you, brother, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, meaning I'm up on the altar, but at the same time, I'm on the altar to do his work. So, so, here we go. Here's this strange paradox. I'm not, I don't have a long... I don't have a big long sermon. You only got like four slides, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four. Okay, here we go. It's a strange paradox. Let's get this. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. Me. Let's y'all ready to dig down with the plow a little bit? Let's drop the plow. Someone say, drop the plow. All right, ready? Drop it down. Someone say, drop it down. Drop it. Amen. Yeah, I was preaching in the black church not long ago, and he kept saying, drop that plow, preacher. Drop it down. Drop it down. Drop that plow, preacher. Drop it. <laughs> Why, it was so awesome. I said, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'll give you a chance. Drop that plow. This is good stuff. Drop it. All right. All right, get ready. God's called us to be selfless. Not selfish, selfless. And because he's called us to be selfless, here's how we do it. Here's the test. Crucified with Christ. The, the Syrians were trying to find a terrible way to bring their most terrible people to a slow agonizing, painful, excruciating death. And so they came up with the crucifixion. The Romans perfected it. So here they are in this crucifixion. Sometimes these guys are going to appear and be on the cross for days. And while they're on the cross, because they cannot move, wild animals would eat parts of their body while they're on the cross. They would be exposed naked before the world. They would 
actually used to bath them on themselves in front of everybody. Vultures and other birds would pluck out their eyes while they're on the cross. That's some rough stuff. Jesus, because he had the double punishment, he got the scourging and the crucifixion, he only lasted six hours because he had already lost a lot of his blood. But the cross itself will cause you to asphyxiate in your own fluids. And so because of this, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely a terrible way to go. And now Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Does that mean I got to crawl up there and I got to be naked before the world? Let me just say this. Let's, 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 let's paraphrase that to put the paradox here. It doesn't mean you got to strip, but it means you do have to be vulnerable. If I'm crucified with Christ, I'm vulnerable to the world. I've got to step out there. I got to be willing to step out and do what it takes, even if I look like an idiot at times. Even if sometimes people will actually hurt me because I'm trying to help them. So, so you got to be vulnerable. Now, you got to be vulnerable. But it can cause, when you're being crucified with Christ, it can cause intense, unbearable pain. Because relationships get severed. Other relationships form, and in the middle of all of this, and they're being misunderstood, and the things going on, it can cause intense pain. So I'm being crucified with Christ. I've got to be vulnerable to everybody. And we're going to just talk about it a little further. We're going to, we're going to nail, nail this down. Amen. I was at the funeral home yesterday. And I was talking with the funeral director, and, and, and I, I said, can I have another one of your pens? It was Hillside. I said, can I have another one of your pens? She says, I just gave you one. I said, yeah, but it already died. And she said, and she looked at me and she said, I'm trying to ignore you, sir. <laughs> okay. So, so, so here we go. Crucified with Christ. It's not always an easy task. And the testimony, I'm dead, but Christ lives in me. So in other words, now what they're saying is, I now live by what Christ has instructed me in his word. So it doesn't always have to be painful, but it can be. But it always causes a shift in your actions. Always. And so the testimony is, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the transfer is this, simply this, simply, the life I now live, I live by faith, by reliance upon God. Because I can tell you, there's a lot of things happening in this world that we don't understand. I get called in a lot of times to help people, I'm going, and they're going, can you please tell me why we're going through this? And I go, I have no idea. I can't tell you. You know, am I, and, and the best one that Lord... The Lord gave me was when, when somebody else, and I used it when, when Bethany died, was this. God said, where, where was God at when my son died? I said, the same place he was at when his son died. He was on the throne and in control. He never relinquishes control. But we don't always understand his motives and his power. And so, so here we go. Watch this now. <clears throat> Get ready. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to try to go ahead and get through this fast. So y'all look like either you're looking for McDonald's or you're looking for me to quit or both. Y'all ready? Somebody say, drop the plow, Pastor. All right. Ready? <clears throat> Here we go. God is so good. Ready? Crucified with Christ. Wow. What does that mean? I've already started to talk about it a little bit, but now I'm going to take it even further. I'm going to take it deeper. Y'all said drop the plow, so here it goes. Y'all ready? Now watch this. Once I'm crucified with Christ, my look changes. I'm not talking about this look, this look. Now I'm focused I'm not looking to the right. I'm not looking to the left. Think of a man on the cross. Here's the man on the cross. You can't look behind me. 
He can't hardly get anywhere. And as the hours go by and he stays on that cross longer, pretty soon it's all he can do to hold his head up. So he's got a focused look. Not looking to the right. I'm not looking to the left. Luke 9 and 5 says that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and he knew what awaited. He was going to die, but he still set his face. That word set means ready to face the danger. Over the years, and I've been guilty of it too, I've noticed people, especially the younger Christians, or maybe somebody that's getting bored with Christianity, I don't know how you can do that, but it's possible, or people that are getting burnt out with Christianity, and usually somebody's bored with Christianity or burnt out with Christianity is because they are not, now they're not actually applying the principles to their life. Because if you apply the principles correctly to your life, you will not burn out. If you apply the principles correctly, you will not get bored. But it's when we start doing like the Galatians and trying to please everybody and trying to please our flesh, then guess what? Then we can get bored, or then we can burn out. So, so Jesus knew that he was going to die, but he knew that was part of the plan, and so he was ready to face danger. I've seen people, they were fine serving God as long as they could get the bread, the, 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 the fish in the loaves. But as soon as it come down where the rubber meets the road and where they had to really buckle down and really, really do some sacrificing and get it done, all of a sudden now they don't have any time. Because now it hurts. Because now there's some things happening that you didn't have happen before. Now you've got to be an example and you don't even want to be in the picture. Isaiah 50 says it. He set his face like a flint, which is hard, impassive, determined, fixed, shall not be ashamed. No matter how things look, no matter how bad things are, there comes a time when you just got to make that stand. You got to stand up. You got to do what is right. Go beyond flesh. Because remember, now you're on the cross. I'm crucified with Christ. I don't have time to look behind me. I don't have time to look at everything else. I'm crucified with Christ. And because I'm crucified with Christ, now I've got to focus on what I'm supposed to be doing as I'm crucified with Christ. Look at this. I'll, I'll get your Bibles out. We'll read it. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. should be one in front of you somewhere. If not, tap the person on the side and say, can I share with you? If there's nobody beside you that you share with, tell the person in front of you, ask you, can you have this Bible? <laughs> can I have your Bible, please? It's so funny that when we go to a pit detention center, we can't give out leather Bibles. We can't give out hardback Bibles. But I bring my leather Bible with me so I can minister to people and I have this card. And whether it be uh, whoever goes with me, and it's been all the guys, they all go with me. Uh, and we can pass that, and it, they'll, look, they'll look through and see my little Bible down there. We go, we want that one right there. We want that black one right there, that brown one right there. And I go, dude, if I give you that one, I won't be able to go home tonight. He said, why? I said, because my wife gave that to me. Knowing that you can't have one of those, you got to have the paperback. He goes, well, maybe you can't. I said, no, you can't have that leather Bible. So I thank God that we got some good Bibles in here. Ready? Now, after the death of Moses, Joshua 1 and 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Stop right there. Moses, my servant, is dead. The mission was the same. Go into the promised land. Take care of business. Occupy till I come. The mission was the same. But the method was getting ready to change. Wow. The mission never changed. But the methods 
were about to change. Moses, the one you trusted, the one that led you out of bondage, the one that worked all these miracles, he is dead. It doesn't work anymore. There's some things behind us that doesn't work anymore. You just leave it and keep on going. Amen? Just leave it and keep on going. Because although the mission is the same, the method has changed. Then he says, Moses, my servant, is dead, and now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Now therefore arise. He was on his knees. He was still in mourning. And God said, why are you mourning what no longer works? Quit mourning what no longer works. The mission is the same. The method is changing. So don't mourn what doesn't work anymore. Celebrate what does. Get up and go forth. Again, we're talking about being crucified in Christ. What he's saying is that word get up actually means to arise means literally to stand up again. Literally. Get back in the game. I can tell you without a doubt in my mind, there's some of you in here, some of you in here, that need to get up. You need to get back in the game. You've been hurt, something's gone wrong, somewhere along the way, you got your, you climbed down off the cross, you climbed off the altar, flesh gets in the way, and now it's all about me, all about me, all about me. And God said, no, it's about him, it's about him, it's about him. In his kingdom. Or maybe you're, you're mourning the old way that no longer is effective. The mission has never changed. Go out and win the lost. Go out and bring them in. There's a heaven to win. There's a, 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 a hell to fight. That mission has not changed. But there's a time when God changes the method. If you're born, change the method. So here we go. Arise. Go over this Jordan and all the people into the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses. In other words, once you get back in the game, quit mourning what's behind, start moving forward, grab a hold of the mission again, what you can do is unlimited. What you can achieve is unlimited. What can happen in your life is unlimited. How does that know that what you can do for Christ is unlimited? Isn't that awesome? What you can win for Christ is unlimited. What you can do is unlimited. But you've got to quit more than the past, move forward, get a hold of the mission, get back up on the cross, get beyond me, 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 and go, God, it's about you. Amen? So, from the wilderness of Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the high tides and under the sea, great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man to, able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage from this people. But thou shalt divide and inheritance the land which I swear unto the fathers to give them. Only oh, be thou now strong and very courageous. Now, why does it to be strong and courageous if God suddenly gave the land? Because he gave him the land, but the land had obstacles. The land had giants. The land had walled cities. They had to fight for it. God, didn't, God was not a cosmic sugar daddy. God was a warrior. And he said, I want you to go take the land that I have given you. Meaning, even though they had to give it to them, they had to fight. It literally means... They've got permission to go take that land, but in order to get it, now they're going to have to do something. I mean, look at somebody and say, you got to do something too. Amen. I'm going to be not strong or very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Look, we don't, we don't have time to be one about the church down the road or the family over here and well, look at that car look at that well, look at God I'm trying to serve you but I'm trying to keep up with all this and God says if you just keep up with me I'll take care of all this you keep up with me I'll take care of all the rest of it 
So now, now here we go. It, it is good stuff. Okay, okay. So now watch this. It's a focus look. But not only is it a focus look. You know, that look again, remember, think about it. That hurts. That hurts. Nobody ever said it was going to be easy. That hurts. So now, another way, another way, another way. There you go. Not only is he looking in the right place. Watch this. Here we go. There we go. Go that way. Some birds you just can't train. Are you ready? Not only is it a proper look, it's a progressive look. It's not behind, but it's ahead. Philippians 4, 3, 13 and 14 says, Begin those things which are behind and reaching forth for those things which are before. I press toward the prize, the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Keep on moving. You know, uh, uh, Bethany, bless her heart, when she went to all those rehabs and she came back to rehabs, and I don't know what it was, the, the traffic was in the way or something or I dropped something. I was already just worn out from trying to go up there to Charlotte all the time and see her and come back and, and driving all these hours and trying to do school work at the same time and, and doing my homework and doing church work and all this stuff. And, and, uh, and, and uh, I said, is this it? I can't get any further than this. And Bethany said, baby steps, Dad. Baby steps. And I said, excuse me, girl. She said, that's what they tell us. In rehab. Don't try to conquer a mountain all at one time. Baby steps. So, so Dan, if you can put on your little shoes with the little bells on them, take some baby steps, you'd be a whole lot better off. Thank you, dear. Why don't you just preach a sermon to me, won't you? And then somebody else did something, and Bethany said, and they, they fell off the wagon, so to speak. And Bethany said, don't worry, Dad, they're just having quitting practice. When you move forward, you may have to take baby steps. And as you move forward, you may fall down a few times. You may revert back to the old ways, but remember this, it's quitting practice. I've been telling those guys, this is B5, hey man, take baby steps, and and fellas, come on now, let's quit and practice, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. Just keep moving forward. As long as you're moving forward, something good is going to happen. So, so it's a progressive thing. But as long as it's a progressive look, I'm getting ready to close. Let's see, I've only got to see how many more slides have I got. Page one, two, three, and I'm playing. Two more slides. This slide and the next one. Matter of fact, guys, y'all can get ready for playing something. It's a prophetic look. I didn't say pathetic, I said prophetic. Look, and this gives me hope. Watch this. The Bible says in Luke 21, 25, and 28 that in the end times, men's hearts are going to fail them from looking at what's happening around them and seeing what's going on. But when you see this, you look up, you lift up your head, for your redemption draws nigh. What he's saying is, instead of losing it, when things are going crazy around you, and you're trying to move forward, lift up your head and say, God, I need some help. And I promise you, as you're trying to take that cross, God will send a Simon of Cyrene to help you. Guaranteed. Somebody you might least expect to help you tote that cross, to help you stay on that cross. You see, this verse right here, it represents a state of mind. The men are looking around at what's going on. Mankind, they're getting depressed. Hearts are failing them. But also, it is a state of expectancy. Because when you see this stuff happening, your redemption draws nigh. 
God's got a way of doing things. You know, there was one young man that was in B5, and he got kicked out of B5 for fighting. And I hadn't seen him, I don't know, weeks. And then uh, the guys would go in on Thursday night to minister. We would go to minister. I heard that he wanted to see me. I didn't know where he was at. There's, there were five, six, seven hundred people in there. It's kind of hard just to pinpoint one guy without proper documentation. I wanted to serve his name. And so I looked up in my little box, counseling box, and there was things thrown in the box, magazines and stuff. And so when I pulled it out, I said, I thought there was a note here from this guy. Well, I couldn't find the note. And I kept looking, I kept looking, I kept pulling up, looking through all like five pieces of paper. So finally, I took a piece of paper that it looked like it was nothing on it or something on the wrong side. And I flipped it over and opened it up and find there was that guy, his name. He says, can you please come to A1 to see me? So I go up front and say, is this guy still in A1? He goes, no, he's not in A1, he's in A3. Right four. And so, so, so I go up there and I say, can y'all get this guy out of A4 for me? And, and then come down to the in, uh, interview room. And so they let him out and we go to the interview room to talk. And he looked at me and tears come in his eyes. And he said, you know what? He said, I go to court Monday. And he said, God, is there any way you can send David Lynn to see me before I go. And he said, I'm sitting there reading my Bible and I'm thinking about the things that happened. I'm going to tell my tell, tell the lawyer and tell the things. And he said, and a, and a guard says, come up, we're supposed to see you in the interview room. And he said, it must be my lawyer. And he comes and looks and there's David Lynn. And he said, I've been praying all day. If I, just, if I could just see David, I think I can get some things worked out because he, he, he might can help me with some things. And sure enough, we talked. God just did something for that guy that night. And he got some information he carried to the judge that he wouldn't have had if I hadn't talked to him. And I thought about that. Here he is, not carrying the same kind of cross we're carrying. Kicked out of the rehab program put in general population by himself, staying by himself, all off, and saying, God, I'm trying to put my cross so this stuff doesn't happen again. And I need a sign. And God sends him. Wow. He cried. And he cried and he cried. He said, I cannot believe how good my God is to answer that prayer just before I leave to go to court. I can promise you, we got more to go, a lot more to go. <laughs> the world just sees us walking around like this, but if you can see what God sees, that's what he sees. If you climb off that cross, you're going to see a lot of things shatter before you. You need to stay on that cross. You know, Mighty Army stuff is really awesome that in B5, around the counseling room, they have little sayings all along the wall. And I just thought it was awesome. They didn't get it from me. They got it from somebody else. But as I look around the wall, all I'm seeing is mighty army stuff around the wall. And here's one of my favorites. When you're trying to carry your cross, and you're trying to be crucified, and you feel like you can't take it anymore, you can't make it. Watch this. 
If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Whatever you have to do to keep it moving forward. Right now, as I'm talking to you, it's getting real. I want you to think about it. It's important. Nobody looking around. Every eye closed. Every head bowed. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm not going to make an example out of you. You don't even have to come up here. What we can do, you can do from your seat. In this place today, you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. But you want to before you leave. Why nobody else is looking around? But you just put their hand up and say, You're talking to me, Pastor. I want to know him before I leave. Maybe you're here. And at one time, you had it together with God. You were up on that altar. You were up on that cross. You were facing one direction. You were seeing good stuff happening. But somewhere along the way, like the Galatians, you began trying to please too many people, even yourself. And as you did, you find your relationship with God dwindling away. And so many times we blame on everybody else. But here's where it gets real. We don't have time to blame anybody else. Yes, there could be others involved. But if you're here today and you are not where you want to be with God, if something's happened somewhere along the line and your relationship was severed or even hanging on by a cord when nobody's looking around, every eye closed, would you put up that hand and say, you're talking to me, Pastor. I need to put together. I need for God to help put me back together 
again, a desire of that relationship. Nobody looking, just slip up that hand. Let's pray together. Everybody. Lord, I know I can't do this in my own strength. I need you to do something for me that I cannot do for myself. I give you me. I blame no one else. I give you me. I thank you, God, as I recommit my life to you. And I thank you, God, for putting me back together again in the name of Jesus. Now, another question. Have you noticed Satan affecting your mind and infecting it and affecting your life and infecting it and affecting your relationships and infecting it? And you have found yourself looking in too many directions. And you see the boulder getting ready to fall on you, but you don't know what to do. God's got this. God's got it. We've got to trust Him with it. We've got to crawl back on that altar. We've got to crawl back up on that cross. Watch what God can do. Nobody look around, every eye closed. If I'm talking to you right now. Your mind, your life, your relationships are shattering, exploding. And the cross is further away from you. And you're needing God to do something to handle it all. Would you just put up that hand quickly, just quickly? Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. One more prayer. Y'all pray everybody together out loud. Lord, I need you to heal this infection in my mind, in my life, in my relationships. Father, I need to help me climb back up on the cross, to climb back on the altar, and you use me once again, Lord. I thank you for it. I praise you for it. I know that you got this. Now, for all those things we just prayed, give Lord a hand clap on. Praise. Y'all read that loud with me if you can see it. That's all now. I can't. It's too, too light. Ready? If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Try that one more time. Y'all sounding good. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And I promise you that God will help you do it if you get that mentality. Amen? Look at somebody and tell them God is awesome. God is awesome. Anybody need to come to the altar for anything else? You want prayer? Anybody else? Tuesday night. We're having a good time. Come on and check it out. Look at somebody and say, God's got this. And either way, I'm in. Amen. One more time, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on. God is so awesome. All the time. God is so awesome. God is, I got it, I got it. All right. God's good. All the time. <laughs> Brother Dudley, we dispense us from prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this meeting. We thank you for the message we have received. We ask that you bless it be upon each and every one in this church today and everywhere else.
certainly say our prayers to you, your son, Christ Jesus. Amen.